All right, Chelsea fans, welcome back to another episode of the London Is Blue podcast. As there's just Brandon Joe Mooko, not Nick, but Dan. His turn to take the weekend off. We're here for the West Ham match review. It's almost as if he knew, Dan. Brilliant tactical maneuver by one Nick Verlaney to swerve the match review and hang out in the Ozarks to get a little vitamin D, to enjoy some brews, to have some time on a boat. I think he might have made the best decision out of many Chelsea supporters this weekend. Yeah, as, as I think a lot of you would say, a surprisingly good tactical decision from one Nick Verlaney. Usually he's the guy who just plows through whatever is in front of him. But uh, no, relaxing and swerving at his finest. We're going to be talking about the West Ham match review. As you already know, uh, Dan and I will get through it, right? Just the two of us, but there's plenty of uh, stuff to cover. Uh, it is early, but... Um, you know how we do. We always want to get in and get ahead of things before we go. So um, we'll be covering the loss, right, to the Hammers. Tale of two has very much, very much true. I know we say it a lot, and it's like one of those announcer things, but this is diff- definitely two different matches. Um, and then how maybe Chelsea can continue to help Potch as we journey on this campaign. So let's jump into it with the three-word match view, as we always do. A uh, lot of engagement on this one, if I uh, saw correctly on Twitter. You did indeed. This one, very close to cracking the 400 number in terms of people wanting to voice their opinion. And we'll start with Janique with the second half hammering, very on the nose. You had five takes on the five stripes with a billion per point. The billion theme was very prominent today. Jay Sykes also with the billion dollar whimper and Shane with the billion dollar babies. A lot of different ways to use the billion to brandy around and give Chelsea a little bit of a tap on the nose with the newspaper. They had Harry with the same but different Nicholas with the ends. Oh no. And then I tried to find a few. There weren't a lot that were a little bit more positive, but Glenn with the keep the receipts, I think because this might come good at the end of the season. And then Candon, or Cadden with the on to Luton, very much a Patriot style on to the next team because we need to forget about this one quickly because the next match is Friday. Yeah, not ideal uh, for many reasons, but we'll we'll touch on that um, uh, it's a little bit later. I would say uh, I'm going with send offs, debuts, penalties because it was nice. a whirlwind like of, of action today. Unfortunately, not breaking our way. But what about you? So for those who have not seen it before, there was a press conference where Jim Mora, at the time, who was the Indianapolis Colts head coach, when they played a terrible game, he said, playoffs, talking about playoffs. And that is, I think, the vibe right now where it's about like just – because he was talking about the fact that like you can't even consider the larger conversation before you fix the basic fundamentals of like what your team is and isn't doing correctly. And that is that is effectively where we're at right now. So playoffs, talking playoffs, through our match review. Yeah. Um, it, it's obviously early days. I think a lot of people are looking to uh, maybe get involved and, and make sure that we can, you know, be challengers this season but uh you know game week two match week two however you want to split it a lot of different ways uh before we get into it we just want to shout us out to you to say please help we would always appreciate it when you do especially at the beginning of the season a lot of new earballs dan uh we did a live stream post match today you and i even uh through the doom and gloom and so a lot of effort and content is going into youtube mainly because we don't have enough space on the feed you alone i'm pretty sure did nine podcasts last week and there's only seven days let alone business days Look, it's not about the number of podcasts we do. It's about making sure we serve our wonderful community. So if you go to YouTube, you can subscribe and you can get notified when we do new episodes. We'll try to do more in the match reviews, which is exciting, like in-moment live kind of chat and conversation. So look for more of that there. We also are looking for help and support. Five Star Reviews, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You mentioned that as well. And also, you know, we'd love some help and support on patreon.com forward slash London Blue Pod. If you'd like to help us out, join our Discord community, our wonderful family of friends who chat a lot about Chelsea. And you might find a home there as well, too. So great ways to support the podcast. But uh, again, just listening, recommending it, sharing with others, always appreciated, too. 
All right. Well, a lot of stuff going on. Uh, we'll touch on more in a little bit, but we do want to jump into the meat of this one. It was West Ham this past 20th of August in the Premier League at the London or Olympic Stadium, depending on how mad you are about that. And scoreline, in case you missed it, West Ham 3, Chelsea 1. Goals from Aguerd, who will later be sent off in the seventh minute. Off a set piece, James Ward Prowse, no surprise there. But Chuck will make it tied it up in the 20th minute. Uh, and then on the other side, we had Ant- Mikel Antonio in the 53rd. Also, Ward Prowse, check your fantasy teams in the 90th plus five. Paqueta from the penalty spot. The villain got his day. Worst, worst case scenario. We're not going to do the fifth stand. He highlight. cashed in, Brandon. He cashed in. Look, what was that caution about the third minute? He got injured, and then he got his caution later in the first half, uh, very innocuously. Uh, things are getting a little bit warm for him, maybe a little bit uncomfortable, uh, one might see. So we'll have to see how that shakes out. But um, looking at – we're not going to do the fist hand highlights because, look, we're, we're just going to spare you from that. But if you haven't downloaded the official Chelsea FC app, do it. They've actually done a ton of work on it, and it's looking a lot better than last year. So if it bummed you out last season, check it out. You might be surprised. So, Dan, go ahead and run us through the starting lineup for this one. That's right. Sanchez between the sticks with DeSauce, Tiago Silva, and Levi Colwell as a back three. You have Ben Chilwell and Mal Gusto on the wings with Connor Gallagher and Enzo Fernandez in the middle with Raheem Sterling and Carney Chukwameka standing or playing behind one Nicholas Jackson. We had many subs used, including Mikhailo Mudrik, who came in for the injured Carney Chukwameka. You had Moises Caicedo come in then next for Ben Chilwell. And then Noni Matawake came in for Gallagher. And then last but not least, Mason Burstow came in for Malagusto. Look, Bergstrom, Monson, Humphreys, Kukurea, Ugo Chukwu, all in use subs. So we only got four out of the five views, which is, I think, two matches now out of two. Four out of five. Yeah. I mean, it, it was kind of interesting. We, we, we'll we talk about it here in a second uh, on the bench specifically. Uh, some of the top line stats, obviously we lost 3-1, but Chelsea had an XG of 2.45 to West Ham's 1.8. And I tell you what, they didn't have that, uh, that 1.8 number until quite late in the match. The penalty, what are they usually about, 0.9? 0.79 is actually the penalty. So if Good you take that out from there's 1.01 would be the expected goals for West Ham. Um, you know, obviously that hurts Chelsea's as well. Um, so they're in the high ones, but you know, still you, you need to convert yeah, penalties. That that is true. So I guess that's maybe you know even enough. Uh, half a goal is a lot. In, in this game when it comes to X's and G's. Uh, ball possession, we had an overwhelming 76%. Uh, them getting an early goal played right into the hand that they wanted. We had 17 shots, only four on target to their 12 shots with six on target. We had nine off target and four that were blocks, which caused a little bit of chaos. Uh, we had nine corner kicks, which were as a ton. We had three cautions to their four. They did get the red card, the double caution, we can talk about that. Um, let's see what else. We had one big chance to there two, and we missed one. They scored both. Big difference. They even hit the woodwork, which it was the outside of the post. Not as worried about it. Um, three saves apiece for the goalkeepers. And interesting, they're adding this one on Sofa Score. Goals prevented. Sanchez with a negative 0.33. And uh, not Fabianski, but um, I can picture him. Ariola getting a yep. 0. 0.5 goals prevented. So look, that's almost uh, you know it's a 0. 0.83 swing, which is which is pretty significant. So anything stand out to you there as far as like the lopsidedness of this match, albeit the the only two categories that matter. The offside one is just one I would call it because you also had one that was yeah was it an offside because. It was a real rough drawing on the VAR for Nico Jackson on that one particular offside that he was adjudicated to have gone too early. And then the goalkeeper rams into him and would have had a very, very early call for a penalty. But again, VAR has not done great work, I think, for most teams over the past two weekends. And so I'm sure Howard Webb will enjoy letting people know that they messed up and they made a mistake and they're going to work hard to fix it. But we should just not rely upon VAR to give us much at all and make our own luck instead, which is proving to be very difficult. 
Yeah, at least it finally uh, corrected itself against Manchester United uh, this weekend. One random stat from at Squawka underscore live. Chelsea have lost four consecutive London derbies for the first time in Premier League history. Lost 2-0 to Tottenham away, 2-0 to Brentford at home, 3-1 to Arsenal away, and now 3-1 to to West Ham away. I would also say there's more London teams now than ever, but that doesn't make it any better. Uh, we should just be a lot better when it comes to the the City Rivals. It said they've just won one win in their last 14 Premier League games. Look, a lot of this from last season. I just want to remind everybody, Dan, last season was bad. Last season sucked. I think they're cherry-picking us a little bit. Yeah, it's unfortunate. And I think the the other second stat I threw in there was that two that Moises Caicedo is just the second player to give away a penalty on his Premier League debut for Chelsea after Wayne Bridge versus Liverpool in August of 2003 baptism. Yeah, not wrong at all. Uh, tough day for him. I saw who was it? Uh, the secret scout who has obviously tweeted that transfer from start to finish uh, pretty lively. Even they said, um, it, this is a guy who looks like he didn't have a preseason and just bad decision, right? He's not used to being in the, the fires of it and the throes of it. And, and that, that showed a little bit today, unfortunately. So, uh, even though Nick's not here, do we have a, a Nick Verlaine patented eye test shit house moment of the match? I mean, nothing. I, I have one that was like kind of light, right? When, uh, Gallagher got in Paqueta, Paqueta's face yeah. a little bit and they were trying to almost draw a second yellow. And didn't he call him like a cry baby or something like that? Everyone was reading lips. Yeah, that would probably be the one moment, but I don't think you can have a shit house moment in the match when you lose three, one. Yeah, well, that's fair. At least there's a little bit of spirit from somebody. But anyways, uh, we're going to take a first ad break when we get back, uh, all about the first half and dive into the match. Thank you to the sponsors and we'll be right back. All right, before we do that, Blue Royalty rocking on their feed uh, as the Women's World Cup just wrapped up. You'll get a full recap of that one and a look ahead to the um, FAWSL season. A lot of talk about Emma Hayes and what she's cooking this season, Dan. They have not stopped on the signing, so I'd encourage everyone to go check it out. But you are way more involved with the newsletter, which is back. We've got Sam leading the charge this season. We do. I'm not sure what he's going to be writing about this week, but boy, oh boy, uh, you can go to any of our social profiles or look at your show notes. But there's the link to londonisblue.beehive, that's H-I-I-V dot com, and sign up there. Sam would appreciate it. It makes him feel nice to know that people are reading and enjoying the content he puts out there. And I'm sure he's going to have plenty of words to review this latest week of Chelsea nonsense. Yeah, uh, we'll see how that shakes out. But Sam is uh, such a talented writer uh, for all Chelsea fans. You you like his player analysis stuff. Make sure to go check out this newsletter. It comes out every Wednesday. Is that right? It's Wednesday, yeah. That's right, the dispatch. You'll enjoy it. But let's go ahead and get back to the match here and dive in uh, at the beginning. So obviously West Ham getting the very early goal off the set piece. Way too much conversation about James Ward-Prowse joining West Ham, especially with the height that they have. It's kind of looking at the lineup, and um, and I think we can talk about why it was uh, Levi Cole who was playing left back today. It's because we needed height, right? When you've got, uh, let's see, uh, Aguirre, Zuma, Sufal, Suchek, uh, and Mikel Antonio, all as targets in the box with someone as pinpoint accurate is James Ward Prowse Dan that is always going to create issues and it ended up being Connor Gallagher on a guard who got the goal right away at the beginning of this match yeah they pointed out and when you watch it back that he was looking at the man versus looking at the flight of the ball and so by the time he turned around to look at the flight of the ball he, he had lost him so he was not going to be able to get back up to him. You could argue that maybe there was a little bit of a push in the back, but even then, it's the type of light jostling that goes on in the box. I don't think that was going to ever be a situation where they would call a foul on it unless he had fallen to the ground and was unable to you know, get on him. Like, he did turn, he did, but he just was separated. There was enough separation, and Sanchez just watched it fly in. You know, it really was not any type of movement there to try to find himself in a position to maybe even make a make a attempt at it. So it really unfortunate because I think if you were looking at this game and saying, how is West Ham going to hurt you? I think it was on the counter and with set pieces. And that is exactly 
how it started. It was one of the two things that you would have been most fearful of if you're Pochettino and the coaching staff of where this team has a deficiency. It would be on set pieces. And actually, it's very reminiscent of the way that the team has guarded set pieces for quite some period of time. So even with a massive influx of new players. Yeah, I know it got so bad to the point we had a set piece coach for a while, uh, which was fun. Uh, Dan, in in when it comes to defending set pieces, here's what they tell the defenders, right? Which obviously Connor Gallagher was one at the time. You can lose your man, you can even lose the ball, but you absolutely cannot lose both, and that's what Connor did. Unfortunately, got stuck in no man's land. He's always going to have a tough battle against him. Uh, I'm not going to take the time to look up how tall Garrett is, but it's a center back versus what a five, nine, five, 10 center mid box to box engine motor guy. It's just, he's always going to have a leg up. So the other thing I guess we can talk about is the, the lineup. Cause this plays into it. Surely Potch is thinking about this. Everyone is saying, Hey, it was a three, four, two, one Potch and even CFC central Sam saying guys, this is a four, two, three, one. What they're saying, what they're saying is that Levi Cole had to play left back, and Ben Chill was actually more of a left mid, left winger. And the reason I think Dan that you ended up having Malagusta play right back, Disasi play right center back, Silva left center back, and Cole will uncomfortably as a left back. I'm sure I, he played it in the academy and probably at Brighton and all these other things. It wasn't his his most comfortable position, and Chilwa got pushed up was because of the height. When you have Connor Gallagher and Enzo Fernandez right? No height in midfield. When you've got Carney Chukwameka, he's got some size. Nico Jackson, he's got some size. Like, I think Pochettino sacrificed probably their ideal team setup just to get some height in to combat that against West Ham because it's David freaking Moyes. Of course they're going to be good at this. They've got James Ward Prowse. Of course this is going to be a thing. They probably don't even run shadow play. They just run set pieces for hours at a time. And I think that's why we got forced into an uncomfortable type of lineup this early in the season, which again, with all the changes that we've made this summer and additions and signings, we're still one injury away from like having a limped up lineup. It's just, it's crazy to think. Well, we we are already in limped up, limped up lineup territory at the moment. When you think about the number of players who are already on the bench, I think it's eight now nine with Chuck Ameka senior players who are not available for this team at the moment. Now, some are close to coming back. We know like Armando Broya is close to getting out of his fitness regimen. We know that Benoit Beto Shield is getting close to being ready again. But you have a couple like Reese James, who thankfully it's been put out there that it's more likely a month that we're going to be without Reese James versus multiple months. Very good news from very late in the week when Pochettino had his pre-match press conference. To the point now where you look at the decisions that Pochettino is making and you think about the last two matches and who would have started in the last two matches if everybody was healthy. And that was Christopher and Klunku and how different both of those matches would have been with a player who does have good aerial presence and is capable like of absorbing the ball, scoring with the ball and helping create with others. And we are just very deficient right now in the attacking phase and we are trying to band-aid together and i appreciate that pochettino has come into what is still a team in flux this team is not anywhere near the final product this lineup will not be the lineup for the majority of the season once everything settles yeah which again with what we've been through this summer is pretty crazy to think about. Um, I talk about a positive right away. The reaction to the goal, Chelsea stepped up the tempo. We're quick to respond, but again, you're like, you know, it would have been nice to do this from, from level rather than having to chase, but we chased and they chased well, which, you know, credit where it's due. Raheem Sterling. We we have to just talk about this right away because he was a man on fire today. His fast twitch muscles were juiced and ready to go. I haven't seen Raheem. So in preseason, we all were like, Raheem, not doing it. It's because he kept putting his foot on top of the ball. He slowed down the play. It would kind of kill the fluidity and the movement. Today, he put out his foot on the ball to flat foot the defender and then was gone, right? His ability to create one, two, three yards of space was, uh, someone's like, he's, we're talking like three years ago 
uh, type of a player. This isn't something we've really seen, let alone consistently at Chelsea, but all of a sudden we are snapped back forcefully on what kind of a player Raheem Sterling can be when he's on his day. We just have to hope there's more of this. I, I even said it. I, I can't will any more for Raheem to get a goal and assist, Dan. He ended up drawing the penalty, which was, mm-hmm. I was like, here it is. It counts. This is an assist, right? We won't talk about how that went, but over and over today, he was so central to the team, uh, played on the wing, played as number 10 a little bit, and uh, I'm pretty sure completed the full 90 because he was by far and away our most creative and direct player um, uh, in those kind of like that three supporting role positions that we had out there. He's definitely one of them. When you look at his heat map, and so if you think about the pitch and you look at the split it down the middle at the you know middle of the pitch, and his line, his heat map was like basically a direct line from the top right hand side all the way to the very far right post of the you know, opposition goal. And it was just hot red on receipt and hot red right at the end of the box. And so ultimately, like he was in the positions he needed to be in as a right sided attacker in this game to try and create for Chelsea. The movement was good. The. Decision making improved throughout the game. So I think that was something that, you know, where people had criticized Raheem in the build up to preseason wasn't necessarily that he didn't look like he was getting up to fitness, like he was integrated with the team. It's been about what does he do when he has that last opportunity to either shoot or pass or lay off. And if I'm Raheem Sterling, there are a couple of times where I put that ball into somebody else's feet today. And I'm wondering how they didn't take a shot, how they didn't force the keeper into a situation. There was the one where he crossed it and two, two players definitely had a chance. You could argue that three players could have had a chance for it. And yeah, I ultimately, if he can continue to replicate this performance next, next out, out against Luton uh, and continue to drive this narrative, like he, I mean, he's a starter right now. Like, he is a starter amongst our attacking core, and I don't think many of the others have a claim yet to be a starter ahead of him. Raheem Sterling, if he continues this throughout the season, will be our player of the year. I mean, no, that's a long ways away. And this is one data point, but check this out. Six for seven dribbles attempted were successful, right? Won a penalty. One key pass. He had, he had six crosses. To your point, only two were successful. I think a lot of us would blame the attackers rather than him uh, getting the ball in. He won 12 of his 20 ground duels. That is something that I've even complained about Raheem is he doesn't do the other side of the work. He absolutely did today, right? Um, and he was fouled five times. He only got one shot away in the entire match. It was blocked. Uh, nothing on goal, which I think is the only thing lacking in that point. But like, if he can average drawing a penalty every other match, like we're we would be really happy with that. We'll sort out the rest of it. But sure, uh, Raheem Sterling like stood on his head today. Was ruled back the years. Got I, everyone got excited about him again, and he needed that. I, hell, Dan, we needed that as fans to be reminded of the Raheem Sterling that we bought for uh, for Man City. For big money and big wages because he is an experienced player. We need him to be uh, leading from the front. And that's exactly what he did today, uh, which is fantastic. His counterpart on the left side, known affectionately as Carnes, Chuck Wameka, was equally as good, if probably not even better in the first half because he got the goal. Uh, and a couple of interesting moments, I would say a little uncomfortable developing the partnership with Joel on the left hand side, trying to figure out when to make his run, when to potentially, you know, find himself in a shot versus a pass situation. But the movement on the goal where he took the right step to then fire to give himself a clean lane and curled it was awesome. That was a awesome goal. And if you look at it, it was a 0.08 XG. So like, you know, eight out of a hundred times that that type of shot goes in. So really well, really well taken shot and just good interchange. And I think the most unfortunate part is his availability in the channels was 
a really beneficial thing for Ben, a really beneficial thing for for Gallagher, to, you know, in terms of how they were moving the ball, and losing that in the second half was it was almost like nobody was able to replicate it because Mudrick came in on his play in his place, and just there was no chemistry between Mudrick and Chilwell the way there was with Chilwell and 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 Chukwemeka. So ultimately, like I think that was one of the most critical change like there, I, that to me is like the two two sliding door moments of this match is chuck Omeka being injured and then enzo not scoring the penalty yeah i uh i agree with that he you know i i was the lone soldier at the end of preseason be like yeah i don't know about carney like we'll see where he goes and then i did the fpl pod and um they really want to know about Carney Chukameka. And I was like, honestly, he might be the bene- biggest benefactor of Nkuku going down because we don't really have a natural number 10, except when he is on the dribble, he's direct. Uh, he loves to take a shot. We even saw that last season, didn't come off. Um, that inside out move, you have to do like a little uh, hop on your plant leg and you're setting it up. Like he knew exactly what he wanted to do, put it right around the defender. Uh, which forced uh, Alfonso Ariola to be, uh, you know, um, you know, blocked from his view, and it was such a good goal. And he hit the shit out of it. He celebrated so hard. The team were so happy. Got us level. To your point, created something out of not a lot, and that's what we needed. And I think I tweeted out right after this. I said, if these young kids get a hint of confidence and put a few results together, watch out. There's nothing more dangerous than youngsters with confidence to think that they can do it at this level. And then he goes down injured. And it I think that killed the game. Just deflated. He wouldn't stand up. You knew it was a serious injury the way he was responding. Physios weren't really trying to get him up. And I don't know. I'm surprised it was that big of an effect, but credit to him and his fluidity in that match stand. But the injury absolutely killed it for Chelsea. Yeah, I think there are a couple other things in the first half that made it difficult. So Nico Jackson was making some good runs again, was providing service to others, was trying to make it difficult against a a, a definitely a aggressive center back pairing and you know he again we mentioned it earlier but there was the offside potential penalty shout that didn't get adjudicated. And then Chilwell laid that perfect ball over the top and Nico just headed it over. And we know that's not really a strength of his game, but boy, oh boy, if he could add heading ability to his game, like, you know, remember he's the individuals like, I want to be better than Drogba. Like good way to do that. Get really, really good at heading a goal from that type of situation because Chilwell's delivery there was fantastic. And then, I think the the last part about the first half we would have to talk about is the fact that I mean Chelsea they did get a penalty, Raheem did get fouled in the box, and Enzo st- Enzo was the one to take it, which I was shocked that he was the one to grab the ball and put himself up to take the shot. And I mean credit to anybody who's ever going to take one because uh, I know if I was on a team of eleven, I'm probably not signing up to be the first person to take a uh, take a penalty shot, but. I just don't get the slow run-ups. I would rather someone just power it through and at least test the keeper. Uh, It was a really bad penalty. I don't Mm -hmm. know what else you could say about it. Yeah, look, I it's 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 not great. It's not what we wanted to see. Were you surprised it was Enzo? Uh, Yeah, absolutely. I, I was. I thought. So my mental ranking of players on the pitch in terms of who might go after it. So I thought Nico might go for it. Get your goalkeeper, get, get your, your main striker scoring like goals in the Premier League. Yeah, you want to see goalkeepers <laughs> scoring goals? All right, all right. That's more of yeah. a Brazilian league thing, but I'm open to it. The other ones I thought might actually run up for us, so I thought Chilwell might be another one, and Sterling. So those are my initial three where I was like, okay, I expected one of those individuals. And when it wasn't one of them and it was Enzo, I don't necessarily know if I was disappointed. I was just very surprised that he was the one on on dead ball duty there. Yeah, I mean, look, you could see it potentially, right, in the sense of 
Jorginho took our penalties, center mid, technician, knows what he's doing with the ball. Enzo is also considered a technician, much better than Jorginho putting the ball where he wants. Um, but it was Statman Dave who pointed out, I think he'd only hit five penalties or whatever, and uh, he missed one against Netherlands in the World Cup, and, and he's missed this one. So he didn't have like a big... Uh, it's not like he took them for Benfica before he came here. It seems like it is a little bit new of a skill set. But again, like what these guys do in training, I'm sure it's Im- super impressive. Uh, I didn't get a reverse replay. It looked like an okay penalty. It's not like it was flying into the corner side netting. Um, but at the end of the day, if the goalkeeper goes the right way, um, that he's got a decent chance of getting to it. What I would say is, He seemed like, I thought he was going to do a hesitation, wait for the goalkeeper to move and then play it. But he like kind of did in between where like he waited, but he was always going to pull it. And then he started to go and he still pulled it. And I think maybe he tried to change and that's what took some of the pace off. But it, yeah, it wasn't convincing. Yeah. So there was a, a tweet from John Harrison who runs the head of data science for goalkeeper.com and they've got their metrics that they use, but they said usually on target penalty kicks are saved about 17% of the time, but because of Enzo's poor placement and power meant his PK had an expected save value of 37%. And they even went in to go, they went even further saying that the save actually wasn't even a top one, but it was really down to the fact that his strike was not good that jeopardized and ultimately led to the led to the save. Oh yeah. It was a perfect height for a goalkeeper. Like didn't stretch him high. Wasn't uncomfortably low. It was right at a very comfortable, what we'd say is about hip height. Um, so yeah, I, I would have loved to have taken that one. Um, a lot of chances, you know, if you look at kind of the, uh, what do they call this map where it's a cent- Oh, the attacking momentum map. I mean, mm-hmm. Chelsea were all over West Ham, especially from about the uh, 20th minute on. I mean, we piled on. And I think I, a lot of us are really frustrated. It's like, oh, here we go again, Dan, right? Here we're going we're gonna to do the same damn thing again, give up goals. Uh, like I said at the beginning, West Ham, they wanted to get the one, sit back and defend, and we played right into it, unfortunately. Yeah, it just went from from bad to worse from the first half to the second half in terms of not necessarily converting where we needed to. I mean, the, the Mudrick and Chilwell combo just was really, really tough and didn't necessarily... It made it so the left-hand side wasn't a consideration. And so you had Raheem Sterling, instead of going up against two, there were times where there were like three or four players closing him down because they're like, this is the outlet. If someone is going to hurt it, it's going to be Raheem Sterling setting somebody up. So we're just going to make his life really, really tough for the rest of the day. And ultimately, it just it led to the full downfall of, of this team. Yeah, that's so, so uh, tough. I would say on the VAR, you did put the footnote in here about the encroachment. Unless Suchek cleared it, I, I think it's a non-factor. I know a lot of people are upset that we just wanted a chance to retake it, but I'm like, I don't want VAR getting involved in that. Unless he cleared it, like, he had no effect on on the outcome of that, so. Yeah, I don't I don't think so either. But, I mean, again, you'll you'll take anything you can get when you're in a bad situation or you could have benefited from it. You know, if someone said, hey, we'll give you another chance, nobody was going to say no to that. For sure. But, I mean, ultimately, when we kind of take it to the, like, the second half, yeah. like, that's the sliding door moment, number two, which is, well, if Chelsea had scored the penalty, we were up 2-1. West Ham might be playing a little bit of a different game than actually have to be playing football versus being able to just play the counter, defend deeper. And, of course, we talked about two ways West Ham were going to score. On the counter... And then on a set piece. So they had already gotten the set piece one. Antonio scores the second on a counter and gets set up by James Ward-Prowse. DeSauci and Colwell just really all over the place on the back in that moment. And Antonio did what someone who has played in the Premier League for quite some time does. He put the right power behind it. He whizzed it by Sanchez and... Then Chelsea were down 2-1. So we were on the opposite side of where we should be. So I am I have this pulled up, Dan. And it's the most innocuous ball forward. It ricochets, and so Silva freezes and lets it go by him. 
De Sassi is not close to him because Mikel Antonio's pulled him away. But De Sassi, he gets the ball. He could hoof it. But he takes a touch, and his body's facing upfield, which, fine. I think Connor's three feet from him. He goes right into the pressure. For whatever reason, he, go, he goes back to the right where their attacker's coming from. And then it ricochets, and I think it doesn't go to James Ward Prowse or Sioux Fall or whoever it is, and they just dump one over the top. Because, again, he was with Mikel Antonio, stepped to clean it up because it like fumbled past Silva. Now there's a gap. And at this level, the players are that good on the ball that it just popped out, and he just, dink, ball over the top. Antonio's gone. And then Levi Colwell gets spun off. Disasi doesn't get close to him. I don't know because he's on a caution or doesn't want to give a pe- penalty. And Mikel Antonio just hoofs it, puts his boot through it, and it was it's just what we've seen from him. This is why he's been in the Prem for a, over a decade, essentially. And I love hearing the Keppa would have saved it memes just to shit talk ourselves, but like, yeah, I'll know better. <laughs> No, not at that angle and that speed. Also, an equally low opportunity shot that just converted, and you would hope that your keeper would do better for that. I think the the thought where we had a little bit of optimism again was when we were down 2-1. West Ham, Agard gets his, what should have been a straight red. I feel like you could have argued for that that tackle to be a straight red, but who knows? But anyway, he gets the second yellow West Ham go down to 10 men 14 minutes after the goal. And you're thinking, maybe, maybe this is going to be the opportunity we need to get back into this game. And no. Yeah. That doesn't happen. Hell yeah. 30 minutes up a player. You're like, let's go. Like if I'm a field player, I'm excited. I'm going to run at everybody because you know they're they're down a player. Like this is a, a phenomenal place to be at this level absolutely did not take advantage of it. And unfortunately, Pot, Pot started to make some changes that didn't go off. So uh, we're going to take our last ad break. When we get back, we're going to talk about the changes that didn't really come off and, and see what Pot really had at his disposal. So thanks to the sponsors, and we'll be right back. All right, Dan, uh, Matawaike came on. Great to see him back coming off injury recently. Uh, he looked bright and lively. It's just, it, I don't know if it's just his smile, and he seems like such a fun person that I love seeing Matawaike in the team. Uh, Mason Burst, though, as well, coming on to try to reinvigorate the tack. Obviously, what he talked about, Mudrick, who came on right for half for an injured Carney who just didn't get going. Matawake, though, um, some more positive, I would say. I mean, he got one shot off at the 90th plus second minute. So, I again, I, I don't know how much any of them really influenced the attack. Like The attack shut down for the second half. The attack was a just not not operating in any fashion in any faction, and ultimately you would we would have hoped for something to work out for itself. Like the the left, nothing was happening. You know, Mudrick was not able to kind of get anything going, even when the change to Caicedo came in because that was earlier, right? Like he comes in, Chilwell is replaced, and that gives. Mudrick, hopefully someone to play with, someone to collaborate with, doesn't really end up panning out that way. And then Matawake coming on for Gallagher a little bit later, you would think that that might add some attacking thrust too. And I don't think either of those players really were were able to deliver what the team needed in that moment, which was more shots on goal, more shots on goal, because there just were not enough shots on goal to really test the keeper at all and that is an unfortunate part of it like it's it's not even just shots it's shots on target shots on goal so you can try to force him into making a save and the second half was completely inverse from the first there was no hard work to be done very little hard work to be done the second half right it was just it it didn't matter what we what we did i just i felt like the subs were were disconnected it just feel like potch was throwing people on the pitch you're up a player caicedo coming on i'm like you know whatever big name he's probably gonna be tidy right clean up any potential counterattacks. you'd assume that you could put a caicedo back there so that you could push up your wing backs maybe more aggressively or enzo can play further higher because that way you can defend with less people because he's so good i don't know if you heard he's about 115 million good dan so 
I get that. Manage the game, be tidy at the back. But everything above him, it it was night and day difference between the first half. The system was gone. You think, you think about who who's injured right now. Let's go through it again. Nkunku, Broya, right? Two of your attacking options. Reese James, who's also an extremely talented attacking option when it comes to him being on the pitch. So three of the people that you would think would come on in this scenario because they, you know, at least two of them, let's just say Nkunku and Reese James, had played in preseason, were developing a rhythm, and can absolutely contribute to the attack. We'll take Broy off, and we'll just we'll be kinder to say that there were two players you would have subbed in ahead of some of the other players you did. I mean, Mason Burstow got 15 total minutes to try to impress. You had Medeweke come on four minutes before him, so 19 minutes to impress. Caicedo didn't look fit enough, had really not gotten the full preseason experience here so i mean this is the this is the impact of the of of not getting some of these deals like kaiseido done earlier because you're now actually playing live games where points are on the line and you would have wanted him to be absolutely 100 percent in the way that he's contributing to the team and it's just an unfortunate moment for him where he gets thrown in to try to help out to try to figure something out and it just doesn't pan out appropriately yeah i i hear you Ian Notson could have been an option. I'm, I mean, he would have been more like for like with Chilwell. I get, you know, Mudrick, you know, coming on and then, you know, at the end, you know, moving some people around. But I was a little bit surprised to see Ian Motson. So I know those transfer, uh, you know, rumors are going to heat up around him. Uh, Andre Santos wasn't around. Again, not an attacking player. But then again, the loan rumors heat up as well. So. People starting to read into things a little bit. I don't know. We'll we'll see. Um, super just frustrating the end that Pocket got his penalty. Caicedo, clumsy challenge is what it is. Uh, Sanchez picked away, went big. Pocket went the other way. And I think we all despise Pocket now and hope that he gets suspended for gambling, if that was true. <laughs> if it's true. Uh, uh, yeah, alleged alleged gambling situation that he's involved in. But yeah, I mean, look, I think this type of result early in the season, while it sucks, is definitely something that this team of very young players can learn from. But the learning has to happen in very quick fashion. And what better opportunity than to go up against a Luton side this weekend or this Friday and hopefully put two, three, four goals past them and really just absolutely wipe the memory away of this result. Because if you'd said like, hey, you end up winning, you know, you would have preferred to win your next two games after Liverpool. I think you're in a situation where you now have to go like between now and the international break, you should go out and win every game on on dock. Yeah, you're not wrong. All right, what about some options that we can do here, right? Um, try to help Potch out, right? It's not all doom and gloom. To your point, sure. early season, this is the chance where Podge can use this as a learning point, uh, you know, uh, this a turning point, right? Lessons can be learned. Are you a stick or twist type of a player? Can he trust you? You're going to bow to your way out. And it's Luton Town coming up, like you said. So he should be able to run the same lineup out minus the injury uh, and, and, and really attack it. So um, Fabrizio Romano, as we talk about support, one of the options is transfers. He's saying a formal proposal for New England Revolution Serbian goalkeeper Jorge Petrovic has been handed in for about $15 million. So I'd like to shed some light. I put out some tweets around this. We are about the third or fourth club to make a bid for Petrovic. We are obviously coming from a, a bit of a moment of weakness, right? But Nottingham Forest and not bid while the MLS window was open, which is back in July. The MLS transfer window is now closed. So if they want to go replace him, they have to go get a free agent, which a free agent is like me, someone who is not currently tied to a team. And, and he's gotta, pitching himself, ladies and gentlemen. And Brandon gotta, Busby is available hey, to the New I, England Revolution on I, the free. I texted Cody, my buddy, and I'm like, I know you just had a beautiful baby daughter. I said, you might be getting a call, my man. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, my point is the Revs are doing well this season. To lose Petrovic would be 
a big blow to them because essentially they have to promote their backup to starter, maybe an academy to the third string or, you know, sign a free agent at this point. So it really wouldn't be good for them. But this is about double what they already turned down earlier in the season. 15 million for MLS context is a lot of money uh, when it comes into to buying players. They're usually buying South American players for single millions at this time the revs could go by two three players uh and really bolster but again they almost have to lose this year uh what do you think of dan you've got a nice little player radar here petrovic versus lafont from Nantes, which is ironic because that's where he was potentially going to go to i wonder if chelsea was sniffing around there and this is going to be the food chain that uh, would have played out yeah, I saw this one on, on Seb's timeline using Dimitri's wonderful McLock bot. And it was just interesting that they have a very high overlap in terms of where where they're good at in terms of shot stopping and save percentages. You know, ultimately I think the the big thing is that you need someone who can challenge Sanchez because you can't accept that this is the goalkeeping standard that we're allowing ourselves to have this season. And you, you need someone who can, and I think I've see, already seen people like, oh, if he comes in, people who I trust way more than myself with goalkeeping appraisals, Keir Doyle and others are like, if he comes in, he'll be the starting keeper by October. And Dimitri might have said that. I don't want to make it, you know, make it seem like Keir said that one. But I think Keir had a video on YouTube that was really detailed into like why you should be excited for Petrovic. And yeah, I don't know. I, I just want a second keeper who can challenge our first keeper and potentially take over um, if the first keeper is not doing well. Well, I would say I haven't watched a lot of him, but I think it's normal. A lot of people go, well, what about Gaga? We just signed him from the MLS. He's not good enough. He went to Belgium. Well, wouldn't we just be doing the same thing? I, I would say no. I forgot who my friend is on Twitter that we've been talking about, but they put a nice little thread uh, as well. Um, there's some really good MLS uh, authorities on social media that tell you that that Jorge is ahead of the Gaga curve uh, in this mm-hmm. moment. He's more mature. He's well-rounded. A little bit um, iffy with his feet, but from just he he was going to sit on his line, Dan, and save shots. He's going to need a little bit of help with the aerial duels. But from a pure shot-stopping reflexes standpoint, he has a huge ceiling. And he's young as well. Um, 23. 23. Yeah. So, again, you're talking about someone younger, but he's definitely ahead of that curve. Uh, I think he just made his cap, his debut recently uh, as well. But anyways, uh, I, I think we all know that here, here's the deal. Sanchez could be good enough. It's too early to tell. But the yep. best way to get the best out of your goalkeeper is to have a really good backup to push him to get there. And this would, this would be 15 million to replace Kepa. I mean, his wages wouldn't be high. It'd be a, it'd be a swing, but a bit of a, bit of a gamble. Uh, what about attackers? Seen Potch talked a lot about attackers post-match today. Uh, talking about no backup strikers like they'd want. Obviously Dave gave credit to Broya. Uh, and some attackers talk about Nkunku's injury. Now of Chakameka is big concern. Potch, I mean, come on, why, why not? Just give him a couple more, Dan. You've already spent a billion. What's what's another couple million here? So what's a hundred? What's a hundred million between friends? That's not a good. real question. Pochettino's quote: Naz had it out there. Is but it's the job that is not easy for the club for sure. They're working really hard to add some players. If it's not possible, we need to wait until Nkunku and Broya will be ready, and we have the help of Mason Burstow, which is great to see Mason getting the shout out there. Very very nice. So. I just want to kind of highlight it as like the drop off between the two is that and like who created the action today. And so first half to second half, you went from 11 shots in total to six, three shots on target to one. And in the second half, actually West Ham had four shots on target to R one. Not good. They had six off target. We had six off target to their three uh, R three in the second half and then two blocked to two blocked. So uh, net neutral in the second half. So Chilwell, Enzo, Jackson in the first half, each had two shots apiece out of the total 11. So they had 54% of the first half shots. Their combined XG was 1.69, which is, of the first half of, of the potential XG, that is 81.3% of the total XG. Now, that does include the penalty. So that puts it at like the 0.9 range. So, like, if we want to kind of take it out, but that to me, 
when you think about the other players who ended up coming onto the pitch in the second half, I mean, Mudrick only got one shot. Madueke only got one shot. Gallagher in the second half, only one shot. I mean, he had only one shot in the first half. Like just the people who need to be contributing in the attack. I mean, we, we gave a lot of praise to Sterling. Sterling only had one shot like that. This is, this is, there's not enough. There's not enough happening in the attack to even give ourselves the opportunity to hope for something more than just a goal fluking its way in. Like we are not manufacturing our own luck right now. And it's still the same problems that plagued us last season. And yes, it sucks to have to try to do it without Nkunku and without Sterling two players. If you drop them in today, again, very different game, but this is the hand we've been dealt and you have to try to figure it out. And I think some of that is, do you bring in an attacker who can add more shots per 90? Because that's going to help because I I don't know who you're going to coach up of this grouping to get you the two, three the shots per 90 that getting a Matawake, getting a, a, a Mudrick, even with smaller appearances, getting them up to having one, you know, two shots a game or two and a half or three shots would be a massive increase from where they are right now. I agree. By the way, the social account was football connors here. Uh, check them out. So who are we buying, Dan? Oh, call me mid sip of water. Um, look, I think the or do we are... need to? How about this? It's second match of the season. We were cooking in preseason. We did lose in cuckoo. Losing in cuckoo is massive. I don't know if you guys heard. I put a lot of predictions around him because I think he's really good. Players were playing a little bit out of position today. Again, I said this at the beginning. Is it ideal that Levi Cole is playing left back? No. It's probably better that DeSassi or Thiago Silva are going to get dropped, right? And you go back to a normal back four with even Malagusto and Ben Chilwell is is fullbacks that can push up into wingbacks. Caicedo is going to be there to cover. I don't I don't know if you need right. It's some, we just this wasn't our best eleven. Is the simple answer. Uh, a couple things didn't go our way. Mark Worrell just tweeted right. You, our our record signing gave away a penalty. And our second record signing didn't make a penalty. Right? Like that, this isn't going to be the average, the mean of the season. So I wonder if just a little bit too early, losing Chuck will make it an injury. That wasn't our fault, and he was a driving force behind today. Like, there's a very, very clear understanding of how this match goes Chelsea's way. Is all I'm saying. Counterpoint. Totally. I I think again they're fine margins with major major ramifications to the match in front of us today i will say you need to have an option for a deal to be enacted depending upon how the luton match goes where if you see like you need to have basically something almost to the point of it being locked up so if you decide on friday that chelsea have a bad result and our attacking our attack still stinks that you can bring a player in who's going to make a difference like, I don't know who that is. I mean, we've seen Balogun is another individual we've seen links to. We've seen the Ryan Shirky links come back up over the past eight hours or so. So, again, some of that might just be hope. Some of that might be a recycling of the news article or the aggregation. But you've got Luton Town and you've got AFC Wimbledon and the Carabao Cup and then Nottingham Forest. So you've got three games before the international break. You've got two before the window close and you're going to need to make, need to make a decision very quickly is if you do need to get someone else in. I think part of that's also going to be based upon what happened to Chuck Wameka. Is he healthy enough? Are you loaning or trying to loan out Andre Santos? That's another question. There's just a lot that we're going to learn about over the next 24, 48, 72 hours. It's really going to shape what type of side Pochettino has, but Again, we're we're playing catch up. Like we are playing catch up right now to teams that are a little bit more solidified and who they are, who their di- identity is. And again, Pochettino's been on the job for almost two months. Like, and he's not even been dealing with the majority of his players or his main players for any of that time. So, again, there, there's grace here, there's patience here. But if I'm in the recruitment side of this, I am saying we're working a very, very long next 
11 days to make sure we can do everything we can to set this team up for success. Yeah, I agree. I agree with a lot of that. Um, the Carney, Carney injury is going to be, I think, crucial to whether or not we're, we're going to sure. do some things. There's still other deals that are just up in the air. I mean, it's going to be a wild 10, 11 days of this window, depending on when you listen to this. Uh, all right, Dan in the match, who'd you go with? Everyone who watched it because huh. you had to suffer through it too. Yeah, or at least the second half. Don't really do that on losses, do we? Um, all right, well, I'll let you go ahead and run us around the table. Usually it's Nick that watched uh, other matches this weekend, but since he's off, um, I did watch a little bit of the Villa Everton match. I also watched some of the Liverpool match. And I watched a little bit of Tottenham Man United match. I didn't really watch City Newcastle. Yeah, uh, City Newcastle was a good game. Tottenham Man United was was a good game to watch as well. I watched some of the Brighton Wolves game, and that was a fun watch as well. Particularly if you own many of their fantasy Premier League assets, that's a that's a fun one. Um, so yeah, it was Liverpool three, Bournemouth one, Brighton four, Wolves one, Brentford three, Fulham zero. The Burnley and Luton match was postponed due to Luton's home ground not being ready yet. You had Tottenham two, Man United zero. You had Man City 1, Newcastle 0, Aston Villa 4, Everton 0, and West Ham 3, Chelsea 1. Well, uh, many of interesting results, I would say, mixed up there. And that leaves Brighton at the top of the table. And it pains me to say that. I want Deserby to sink like a rock. Uh, But they are 2 for 2 with a plus 6 goal difference leading the league. Man City 2nd with plus 4 goal difference. Brentford Brentford are in third on four points, along with Liverpool, Tottenham, West Ham, and then Newcastle seventh on three points. Again, these tables are so compressed right now, but Everton, no points, the negative five goal difference in 20th. They were so poor today because Villa did not look good their first match of the season, and they pumped Everton. Wolves expected to be down and amongst it. They are in a negative four goal difference, and Burnley... I think you'd expect to be down there. Negative three. We'll have to see how it shakes out. Uh, Chelsea are in 15th. Troll football saying the last time Chelsea were in the top half of the table, Queen Elizabeth was still alive. We will rectify that, I'm sure, quickly. Just reminds you how bad last season was, Dan. Yeah, not good. I mean, look, you you win. If you had gotten a win, you'd be on the four-point train yeah. with everybody else. And again, this there's a lot of momentum still. But again, this is like cement, right? Cement sets at a certain point and it gets hard to change how it's going to look. So you want to get the early assignment done. <laughs> and you've got two opportunities left before the national break. So I think you just got to you got to say you have to win against Luton. Like, I I, I, yeah. I don't think it's too early in the season to say you have to go win against this Luton team who've who have not played in two weeks because they will have had the game postponed against Burnley. Like they, they should be like a wounded animal and you should come out like the lions. You are the pride of London and attack and destroy and dominate and show people that like this side is going to be a serious thought for people and not just be a, a butt of a joke. Yeah, absolutely. Um, It's a must win. It's Luton. They didn't even play because this past week, which I wonder if that's a benefit that they got two weeks to prepare for this since their stadium wasn't ready and they asked for a postponement. I don't know. I mean, it's not because they they have no idea what our lineup is going to be. All the injuries. (laughs) That and I mean, they need to play. They're brand new to the Premier League. They need to figure out what it's like to play in this league and what to get going. So I would I would say that uh, for them, minutes are definitely better than not. So um, we'll see it goes. But it is not. It's it's a must win just because they're barely got promoted, right? And we're we're Chelsea, so uh, we'll keep you posted. I know we got Matt Law this week. Uh, I'm sure Blue Road to be covering the World Cup final. Um, we play Friday, which is interesting. And we'll have everything on YouTube as well. I miss anything? No, that's it. Jeez. All that and more. Nick will be back. I think, I don't know. He might be taking the rest of the month off. I'm not sure. He's got a busy schedule, but uh, we'll balance it. We'll make sure to happen. Uh, bring in our friends as needed, but hope you've enjoyed it. Chelsea fans. I know it wasn't the win you all wanted, uh, but hopefully we could bring a little bit of clarity and ideas around what to expect moving forward. So again, YouTube, Patreon, and the newsletter. Go check them out. Until next time, Chelsea fans, you know what to do. Get the blue flag flying high.